Hey, first of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. This is, uh, so far I've really enjoyed the talks. I'm looking forward to seeing what else goes on uh, this afternoon. Unfortunately, I am in London, so it's getting towards the end of my day, but I am really excited to see what else is going on here. Um, I've learned a lot. I hope you, you can all learn a little bit from me now. So. I'm Phil. I want to talk a bit about uh, streaming video to the browser uh, without infringing on any patents. So first, a little bit about me. My name's Phil. Like I said, uh, I'm a streaming architect at Mux, helping out with a lot of the streaming here today. Um, I have been in the video industry for about the last 10 years. I am also heavily involved in the community around video. Uh, I organize a, a meetup called London Video Technology Meetup, as well as helping to organize DMUX, a conference for about 750 video engineers in San Francisco this year. Um, I, as I said, I've been in this industry a while, um, but at the start of this year, I got really interested in this concept of building a video system using only free technologies, Libra technologies. And when I originally put together this idea, I originally phrased it as, as reaching as many viewers as possible using only Libra video technologies. Now this actually turned out to be relatively easy. So what I ended up doing is making it a bit harder. So I, I changed it to reaching browser-based viewers, actually makes it a lot harder initially, but also giving a great user experience as possible as well. So it's actually pretty easy to deliver just a more traditional video experience, but when you want to deliver a video experience to the grade of Netflix or YouTube using only Libra technologies, that actually gets a lot harder. So in my, I have my own definition of what Libra video technologies are. Other people might have their own. So to me, Libra video technologies means avoiding patent encumbered or licensable technologies wherever possible, but also preferring technologies that are developed in the open. So I love working in open source communities and open standards as well. And I think that is a great part of the ecosystem and I want to work in that piece of the ecosystem. So you might, to be honest, say, quite fairly. Well, nobody wants that. Well, here's someone who does want it. Wikipedia wants that. Uh, Wikipedia only ingests and delivers files that are free file formats. Now, they refer to that as WebM and OgFiora. There's obviously a lot of codecs involved there, but this is totally how Wikipedia does video today. Now, there are a lot of components to a, a media playback chain. Now, we're a front-end conference. I'm going to talk more heavily on the front-end piece of this. So primarily I'm going to talk about the codec choices, uh, the delivery technology, and the player choices here. And there's a big piece of this is the codec choice really informs a lot of the other decisions here as well. So let's talk a bit about codecs. So you've probably heard of a lot of these video codecs. The one you've probably heard most about is H.264, often referred to as MPEG-4. Um, there is obviously a lot of complication there. MPEG is also obviously container format. MP4 is actually specifically a container format. Um, so it's often confused whether it's an MP4 containing H.264 or not. Um, there's a few Libra protocols out there, a few Libra codecs out there, VP8, VP9, AV1, um, a much more modern codec there. Um, and there's a bunch of patent encumbered codecs as well. Now, when you're starting to build a system, you can actually pretty quickly get rid of a lot of these. Uh, AV1 is just not quite there yet. While it's got a lot of support in browsers, um, the complexity and the time taken to encode the content today is very high, so it's just not feasibly deployable right now. Um, H.265 just doesn't exist in any browsers. H.266 isn't even off the specification table yet. Um, so, and the same kind of goes for these audio codecs. They just don't exist in browser environments. So it's actually a pretty small subset we're working on. So. First thing I did was test those against evergreen browsers. I did that in the most simplistic way possible. I went off and encoded the video and I put it in a video element, right? So uh, we use muted, autoplay, plays in line. It's pretty simple. Um, this is making sure that when I load the page, the video plays back immediately. You have to have muted to do that. Autoplay protection prevents on a lot of browsers now. And plays in line makes sure it plays well on things like iPads. I loaded this up in the Evergreen browsers, and here's what happened. Now, this is this is actually real. I totally went and recorded little screen grabs of each of these running. This isn't faked at all, believe it or not. You can actually see the subtle color differences and timing differences between all these videos, um, which proves it is honestly real. So across the top, we've got our proprietary codec bundle, right? Uh, AVC and AAC in an MPEG-4 container. Uh, plays everywhere, just straight in the video element. Great, fantastic. 
Then we've got our VP8 and VP9 encodes below. And actually, they play pretty well as well. They play across, you know, three out of four of our browsers. So that's actually not a bad starting point. What does that look like in, in numbers? So Chrome's about 71% of the market, depending on how you measure. Uh, Firefox 10%, Safari 5%, we didn't get that 5%, and Edge is 4%. So that gives us straight away 85% coverage on desktop. Um, comparing that to ABC and AAC in an MP4, that'd be somewhere in the region of 95% coverage in a browser. So problems here are really Safari and old Internet Explorer browsers that we need to address. But this is really only part of the story, right? Because over half, depending on when you measure, or up to half, around half, of the web's traffic is mobile. Um, these are really interesting graphs. I love looking at these graphs every month. Um, they often swap and change, and nobody has ever been able to explain to me why there is a sudden dip and a sudden spike in mobile and uh, non-mobile traffic. But anyway, so what I did is I took our same experiment and ran it on mobile devices, on mobile browsers. And here's the results. So this is Chrome on iOS, Safari on iOS, and Chrome on Android as well. So Again, our AVC, AAC, MP4 plays absolutely fine across the board. But unfortunately, our VP8 and VP9 encodes are much less successful here. In fact, none of them successfully play back on any Apple device. Now, this is a pretty big problem when you put this into mobile statistics. So Android Chrome and kind of associated Android browsers that are based on Chrome represent about 41% of mobile market. Um, this means you're missing instantly 37% of the mobile market, and basically it doesn't work on any iOS-based device. So there's a couple of workarounds here, thankfully. We have a polyfill to the rescue here. So there's a couple of polyfills out there that can render unsupported audio codecs in a browser by using a combination of canvas and web audio and rendering directly onto the canvas element. A great example of this is OGV.js, is a dominant in this space. Drawbacks? Yeah, quite a few of them. Uh, obviously, it's quite CPU heavy. It's a non-native experience, so you don't get full screen controls that look the same as you'd expect. Um, there's no media source extension support, no source buffer support. Um, so this is a big, uh, a big difference. Um, Obviously, there is also potentially some limitations. For example, certain qualities of video may not play back smoothly on devices. That can be quite hard to detect as well. It's pretty easy to use. Again, here's the example. Um, I loaded up my VP8, instantiated a new OGV player, pointed it at my file, and hit play. Uh, pretty simple. And here's the demo. So these are our three problematic browsers. So Safari on desktop, um, Safari on iOS, and Chrome on iOS. And they're all now happily playing our VP8, VP9 file. And in fact, this is so successful, this is totally how Wikipedia does it. Um, since August 2015, OGVJS is used on Wikipedia and Wikimedia in Safari and IE and Edge on a bunch of devices uh, where OGV and WebM playback isn't currently available. But that's kind of only part of a story because we need a delivery technology. So first question would be, well, what's wrong with just delivering a, a progressive WebM file? Well, the problem is viewers' bandwidth is changing all the time in the modern internet. So we could totally just do exactly what I've been doing and progressively streaming one file, but some users are going to encounter buffering, which is really bad, um, and some users are going to sacrifice on quality, not going to be able to get the best quality possible. So this is a, a solved problem in the video industry, and it's referred to as adaptive bitrate. It's actually a pretty simple technology. Here's how it works. Um, you take an input file, in this case a very short file, 8 seconds. You encode it to a bunch of what's called different renditions or representations. Uh, in this case I picked half a megabit, 1 megabit, and 2 megabit. And then we segment those files, so we chop it into smaller bits, in this case 2 seconds in duration, so 2, 4, 6, 8. Um, and we chop all of the renditions into those small segments. Then I'm drawing a little graph here to explain what I'm talking about. So then as bandwidth increases, we can work our way through the different renditions. So every couple of seconds, we have to go and download a new segment of video, and we can look at the last segment we downloaded to make a decision about which segment we download next to get the optimal quality or the optimal throughput for the device. Um, let's see that in action. It's actually really, really simple. 
So here's a test player. This is a site I, I built called Phil's Players. Loads up all sorts of different um, options for video players on the web. What we're gonna do is load a demo manifest and see how it works. So I'm gonna click load. And there we go, it's gone off. I'm gonna mute the sound, it's great music this one. Um, and loaded a bit of video. And you'll see there it played at a lower quality then jumped right up to the, the highest quality there. We actually, I think, went through three different qualities. We can see all our different segments coming down here. 001, 002, 003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc. And you can actually see it did go through a bit of a, a path there. It seemed to start on 145K here, then went to one megabit, three megabits, four and a half megabits, six megabits, then 7.8 megabits here. Now, if we, if we go ahead and turn on some network throttling, we should see this behave a little bit differently. Let's do fast 3G. I think this is about um, four, 500 kilobits a second. Let's give it a try and refresh the page, reload our player, clear out all those requests. Oh, thanks, Chrome. And load that demo again. A little bit slower to start up, obviously. Start at 145p, got to the uh, 365p pretty quick, 365 kilobits a second pretty quickly. Um, and it's gonna stick there. Now, if I'm quick and turn off the throttling, what we'll see is it should then go ahead and work its way back up the renditions again. We can see that happening in the network requests. It's jumped up to one megabit, two megabit, three, four and a half. Now, this player has actually buffered quite a long way ahead. So it's actually jumped up the rendition somewhere up here. So if I scrub ahead a little bit, you'll see we're in the 1.1 megabit range here. So somewhere around here, and then it'll actually jump up a little bit further as we, we let the video go on and play. There you go, the three megabit. Metal go right all the way up to the four and a half right at the end. And there you go, just got to the four and a half right at the end. So that's an example of adaptive bitrate in action. So what technologies are there for adaptive bitrate today? So there's a couple, a couple of dominant ones. The one we just saw there is HTTP live streaming or HLS. It uses an M3 U8 manifest file and it serves different renditions using different manifests. So there is a manifest file you load that explains all the different renditions you have. Then there's a manifest file that lists all of the segments for each of those renditions. Um, there's another one called a dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP or DASH. Uh, this is a single XML file and it's a single manifest for all this information. Let's take a look at these manifest files. So here's a HLS manifest. This is the master manifest at the top. Uh, as I said, it describes three different renditions. These aren't the same ones. This is uh, what a 1.6 megabit, a 2.5 megabit, and a 4.7 megabit. Um, and there's a rendition manifest below, a list of segments, segment one, segment two, segment three. This is a 15 second video by the looks of it. Dash is a little more verbose naturally because you kind of have to merge all that information into one manifest. This one's really interesting because it also uses something called segment templating where you, um, the player is expected to be able to work out where the segments lie rather than giving explicit list of segments. Now, if we try and look at these ABR technologies and whether they're free and Libra or patent encumbered, well, it's not really a surprise. Dash is an MPEG standard. It's heavily patented and it even used to have a patent pool for this XML file. It's now disbanded. We'll talk about that in a second. It's a very complicated situation. Um, but then there's HLS, which is actually an Apple standard. Now, it doesn't pass my test of being Libra because it's totally not developed in the open. It is a closed proprietary standard. It has public standards for it, but there's no way I can get involved. There's no way I can drive the direction of that technology. So Dash isn't free? Well, no, for years actually, uh, Dash has been covered by a patent pool under MPEG-LA, but this actually stopped offering licenses in October, 2019. So this is great, right? We can just use it. Well, unfortunately, wait for it. Also in October 2019, um, one of the Dash patent holders who was part of that patent pool, uh, Helios, uh, decided to start suing people for using Dash. And this is a super interesting court case if you go and read about it, um, because it uncovered that there had been negotiations between these H -time, um, Showtime, HBO, Voodoo and Crackle and the MPEG LA, but couldn't come to a conclusion. And that's part of the reason that the MPEG LA disbanded the Dash patent pool because it wasn't feasible to license anymore. Um, so Helios decided, well, we're just gonna go sue you instead. And really they're just demanding money at this point. So we have a problem. We don't have a Libra ABR technology that we can use in a browser today. So 
There's a couple of things we could do. So we could just use HLS. It's not an open standard, but it isn't pattern incumbent. It doesn't pass that other test. Um, there is an ITF snapshot we could work off. Um, HLS with WebM VP8, VP9 though, just isn't supported anywhere right now. It's unlikely to be retroactively added to the specification. That's not the way Apple do things. Um, there was a precedent for building open extensions to HLS, but it actually didn't end that well. Apple decided to go in a very different direction than this extension, and it pretty much killed this extension, unfortunately. So why don't we create an open ABR standard? So <laughs> this is what I did. Um, I created something called MPAG Sash. Uh, it is a simple JSON-based browser-friendly exchange format for adaptive streaming. And of course, I couldn't include talking about this without talking about this XKCD. So MPAG, a little bit of a dig here. This is a Moving Pictures Amateurs Group, simple adaptive streaming over HTTP. And the idea here is we have a really simple manifest file, uh, much more easy to read and understand and digest than the Dash manifest or the HLS manifests. Um, has a bunch of features in here. It takes influence from both HLS and Dash, I'll openly admit that. Um, but it does things that are designed to be really friendly to the APIs you have in a browser to manipulate media. For example, it has media source extension friendly codec strings. And it has things that are explicitly keyed. You'll see there's very few lists in here, a lot of keyed indexes. And this makes for easy manifest parsing. Is it easy to parse though? Well, yeah, it totally is. Here is a simple implementation. This is uh, from my reference player. It grabs the first audio rendition, the first re video rendition, and pushes it into a little uh, media source extension prototype I built. Can you see it working? Well, yep, sure. I'll show you it working if you really want to see it. Here you go. Um, much the same as uh, the player we saw before. Here is a nice little bit of the same piece of content. And as you can see, we have those same adaptive bitrate renditions being loaded, these same segments being loaded down here. Um, separate audio and video, but it, it totally works. It is totally something that can be done. But there's a little bit more of a problem here. So beyond this, uh, ABR needs player support. So there's no point in having an adaptive bitrate algorithm if your player doesn't support it. But even if our player supports it, our polyfills also need to support it. So there's something in media source extensions called source buffers. This is how you switch between different representations, different renditions of your media, and you need those same APIs in your polyfills to make this feasible. Um, speaking of players, I want to mention a couple of players. So there are some great open source video player components. You can go and slot into your website. Video.js is a very comprehensive open source player framework. It's got Dash and HLS support built in. We could totally add a Sash plugin for it or WebM and HLS support if we wanted to build an open Libra system there. It already has an OGVJS integration as well. And in fact, this is what Wikipedia uses. Um, it's licensed under Apache 2. This is a really accessible video player as well. If you want something a little lower level, there's also something called HLSJS. What this does is it adds HLS playback just straight onto the HTML5 video element. Um, and for browsers that don't support it, Safari supports this natively actually, but HLSJS just retrofits this in. Um, we could totally extend this to support WebM with HLS, it's patch 2 license, and it's actually what we're using for streaming the conference today. So here's my proposal, right? Uh, VP9 and Vorbis with WebM, Video.js with OGVJS polyfill gets us a pretty comprehensive coverage today, about 90% on desktop, 80% on mobile. And then we start working on ABR. We decide the direction we're going for adaptive bitrate for open technologies. Uh, and then we start building polyfills that have ABR capabilities built into them. All the code I've shown and all the examples I've shown are open. So that codex test page, you can go and fork it, play with it if you want, and there's a hosted version on GitHub. Uh, the Sash proposal is public. Please, if you're interested, go have a play, give me some feedback, fix my terrible JavaScript, all the usual things. Um, and then also there's my players playground where I showed you the demo of those different players. You can go there, you can learn and play around with how video works on the internet. And with that, I have to say thank you to everyone who listened to me and thank you for inviting me. If you do have questions or corrections or just want to chat, uh, I'm easy to find. I'm totally also in Slack. I'll take a couple of questions now, um, but you can also reach me on phil at mux.com. Uh, thank you so much.